Hello everyone, Dr. Davis here. Um, this will be the first of your last OB lectures. Um, I have split this lecture into two and this part is high risk mom. The second part is high risk baby. These learning objectives are for both um, of the two lectures. So we're going to talk about high-risk mom and baby processes, nursing care. Um, we're going to talk about placenta previa and abruption, hypertensive issues, preeclampsia and eclampsia, help syndrome, and then um, specifically pertaining to the baby, we're going to talk about diabetic moms and babies, um, fetal alcohol syndrome, NAS, and hyperbilirubinemia also known as jaundice. So we're going to start with some of the disorders that you may find while mama is still pregnant. We're going to start with those first. Um, so hyperemesis gravidarum, um, usually known as just hyperemesis, is when mom has um, Vomiting, nausea and vomiting throughout the pregnancy is typically really um, intense at the beginning of the pregnancy and she's unable to keep anything down. Um, it's a constant vomiting throughout the day. Um, so with this, um, they will start calling it hyperemesis if you're unable to keep down any fluids or solid foods for 24 hours. Um, usually this has to do with maternal hormones. So if I have, if I'm pregnant with twins, I'm going to have double the hormones. Sometimes that will cause mom to have hyperemesis. Um, sometimes they will find that um, H. pylori um, can cause um, hyperemesis. Sometimes they find that things like thyroid levels are not not correct and they can um, correct that so we usually go back and try to look they'll do a bunch of lab work trying to see if there's anything that they could um, correct in order to help with this um, hyperemesis now the ladies that actually have true hyperemesis will end up probably with a pick line and they are taught to give themselves IV, IV fluids at home because they're not able to hold down anything. Um, so sometimes um, we also have what people call or say that they are, they have hyperemesis or that they're puking all the time, but really all they're doing is um, spitting. So it's a, it's, basically where they have an excess of saliva that builds up and um, they have to spit it out of their mouth. So you'll see these um, ladies with, um, usually they use a, like a Dr. Pepper bottle or Coke bottle, um, something like that, that they're constantly spitting into. Okay. Um, so that happens as well. So you really have to kind of decide, are, is this really a nausea vomiting kind of thing or are they spitting? Um, so that's, that's two different things. Um, so our assessment is going to be, we're going to look at what kind of weight loss has this person had? Um, are they dehydrated? What does their urine look like? Um, or are they not putting out any, any urine? Um, they'll probably go ahead and do a sonogram of some sort so that they can um, see what's happening. Um, typically, the only way to know for positive that we have twins, triplets, any of those multiple kind of things is going to be through a sonogram. Um, so we'll be looking at that. Then they're going to be looking for any kind of fluid and electrolyte imbalance, as you can imagine, if someone is puking. Um, constantly they will have that imbalance and then they're going to be looking at all these other vitamins that they may need to receive um, intravenously okay so as a nurse <coughs> excuse me our interventions are going to be to weigh this patient daily 
We're going to monitor electrolytes. Um, they'll give antihistamines or vitamin B6 um, for nausea because um, if you remember, you've got some of those antihistamines that are H2 receptor agonists, and those work really well um, for ladies sometimes with um, nausea. Okay, gestational trophoblastic disease, also known as a hydatiform mole. Um, so we had a few years ago had actually taken this out because it's a very rare um, high risk um, problem. So we had actually taken this out of our lectures um, and then some students came back after taking NCLEX and said they actually had a question on hydatiform mole on the NCLEX. So we added it back in and that's why we're going to we're going to talk about it. <clears throat> so basically this is it is a pregnancy. It will put out the pregnancy hormones so mom will think that she is pregnant. Um, basically there's a bunch of vesicles and they're in little grape-like clusters. They actually look like this um, and instead of a baby forming this is what forms. Okay so um, usually there's not an embryo sometimes there is there's there can be an embryo with this as well um, but it does it is a um, a choriocarcinoma meaning it is um, put this patient at risk for uterine cancer um, so typically what we're going to do is you'll start the patient will have bleeding usually in that first trimester. Um, you may have an enlarged uterus, um, bigger than what you expect to see for a patient at that state. So um, those are some of your clues. They usually go ahead and do a DNC and try to clean all that out. And then the patient cannot be pregnant for a year. Now, typically they, um, are going to have to monitor the patient's HCG levels because if they start to spike again, then mom is then at, at risk for developing um, another pregnancy like this or um, cancer. So they're going to watch those HCG levels. They they watch them. Um, they do weekly blood draws on these patients. Um, and we really don't want them to get pregnant for a year because they can um, really have some some very bad risks and outcomes with that. Um, so we're going to make sure that mom knows that any foul smelling discharge, temp over 100.4 or bright red bleeding um, should be reported to their physician. Now um, mom will feel like she's pregnant. She's going to get positive pregnancy pregnancy tests. Um, so many times you do have to refer her to community resources for grief and loss um, because this is really a difficult thing that can happen because um, I thought I was pregnant but no now I'm not I'm actually at risk for having cancer um, and this is something that'll have to be watched throughout the years following this um, high data form mole because they're looking for um, mom to de actually develop this um, choreo carcinoma which is in the lining of that uterus um, so it can be a very um, hard thing to deal with all right ectopic pregnancy so this is where the fertilized egg implants someplace besides inside the uterus where it's supposed to okay so typically the um, egg will end up implanting in the fallopian tube and it is considered a medical emergency because this pregnancy will continue to grow. As it grows, um, A, mom's going to have pain um, and B, they're at risk for that um, tube to rupture. Okay, so if that tube ruptures, then it becomes a real emergency because you have a... a um, 
bleeding into the abdomen. So some of the things that we're going to be looking at is mom may have some absence of early symptoms of pregnancy. I may have a positive pregnancy test, but I'm not having all the nausea and everything else. Um, I will miss my period, but I have a, a, a weird feeling of fullness in my lower abdomen and have lots of lower quadrant pain and tenderness depending on which side, which tube this is in. Um, if this ruptures, if this ectopic pregnancy ruptures that tube, then you're going to have a ton of, of vaginal bleeding. You may have bleeding into the abdomen, like I said. Um, you may have sharp pelvic pain or abdominal pain. You can have what is referred shoulder pain, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about um, uh, placental abruption and uterine rupture. Um, that's the one thing that um, these patients will get, and it's crazy, right? But if you think about it, when we're talking about referred pain, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. When we're talking about referred pain, um, in our body, there are places that do not have pain receptors. So we get pain in other areas to tell us something is wrong, but it's in a different area. So for this instance, there's not a lot of pain receptors in that uterus. So it refers to um, that closest nerve which ends up being shoulder pain. Okay, really crazy, but it's the same thing. Um, if you have a brain freeze. So um, a brain freeze from drinking something really cold is really not your brain, even though that's where your pain is at, it's actually your esophagus is in pain because it's so cold. So that's why you get that referred paid to your head. Okay, so just a short divergence on referred pain. Um, this patient can also go into shock. So <clears throat> we're going to be doing as a nurse, we're going to get this patient um, admitted if we have time. Um, we'll be looking at vital signs. We'll be checking for bleeding, get an IV fluid starting, um, make sure we notify our healthcare provider, um, get the patient ready for a sonogram, and um, they will most likely have some sort of a laparotomy. Um, we'll be giving some pre-op and post-op instructions and get some blood cross-matched and typed so that they are ready to go um, when they go to surgery. So <clears throat> you want to suspect an ectopic pre pregnancy in any woman of childbearing age who comes to the ED clinic or office with unilateral or bilateral abdominal pain. And they're going to have some tenderness there as well. So um, you can kind of palpate and you'll, you'll get some um, abdominal pain from that as well. Okay, so abruptio uh, placenta versus placenta previa. So uh, a placenta abruption versus a previa. So the difference. Um, and these two are lined up because they do ask you these questions and you want to, to know which one is which. Okay, so abruption is going to pain, be painful, a previa is going to be painless. Okay, an abruption is where the placenta starts to pull away from that uterine wall. So that is where the pain comes from. Okay. Usually this is late um, in the third trimester or in labor. Um, this is a true medical emergency. So this is going to be one of those C-sections that we want to do um, a, as a stat C-section. So 30 minutes from decision to incision. Um, the cause is, is unknown. But usually it is related to some kind of blood pressure issues, um, preeclampsia, 
undetected um, gestational hypertension, um, any of those kind of disorders, basically that blood pressure just gets too high um, and the placenta just starts pulling, from, pulling away from that uterine wall. Um, cocaine abuse is a very common cause of abruption. Um, we don't see it as much as we used to in the past, but cocaine will completely blow the uterus, I mean the placenta off of that uterine wall. Um, and you've got to get that baby out very quickly. Um, once that uterus is totally detached from um, the wall of the uterus, baby is no longer getting the um, blood flow, the oxygen, anything that it needs. So you've only got about four minutes before baby starts having neuro deficits. Um, and then you only have a few minutes longer than that before you're going to have a baby that's severely compromised um, and may not survive. So that is um, something that we have to think about when we're thinking about an abruption. Um, a previa is just where the uterus, when it, it implants into the side of, it should implant on the side of the wall of that uterus. But instead what happens is that that um, placenta actually is covering the opening of the cervix. Um, so it can be, there can be different degrees of um, previa covering. It can be a partial um, placenta previa, which means just a little bit of that placenta um, is over the opening. It can be complete, where the entire placenta is over the opening. Um, it can be marginal, where just the edge of the placenta is right at the cervix, or it can be low-lying. So usually what a low-lying placenta means is that it's very low, it's close to that cervix. Typically what happens is early in pregnancy, I get a sonogram, they see that the placenta is a previa, it's over the, the cervix of some sort. And typically what happens, especially with the ones that are partial previas, is as that baby grows and that uterus grows, that placenta kind of moves up the wall. So then you'll have a low-lying placenta instead of a partial placenta. So with these patients, they're going to have to have multiple sonos to um, look at where is this placenta at and if it moves. Because if it does not move, then mom has to have a C-section. Okay, because remember, if my placenta is covering my exit, and then I cannot get out. As the as I'm in labor and that cervix starts to dilate, it's gonna as it dilates, it's gonna pull apart from that placenta. So you're gonna have lots of bleeding because now my placenta, instead of being against that uterine wall, there's an opening now, right? So I have all this bleeding coming out from that placenta. So that's why they say it is painless and you'll have bright red bleeding because it's bleeding straight from that placenta. Um, so blood that should be going to baby and back to mom to be, uh, to be cleaned um, is actually just pouring out of the vagina now. So um, if mom has a complete previa and is in labor, then yeah, that becomes a emergency because we need to go ahead and get um, her c-section done quickly um, because we don't want um, her to continue to dilate and then lose those pieces of the placenta being attached um, for baby okay as the nurse how do i know the difference okay a person that's having an abruption is going to be an immense amount of pain um, they're going to have um, they may have some bleeding now. Um, they may not. They can have a concealed abruption, which just means that the part of the placenta that is pulling away from that uterine wall um, is actually in the center. Um, so it's still seal sealed by the outside edges of that placenta and the bleeding is growing underneath of it. So there is a possibility that you don't have bleeding for an abruption placenta. But please understand these two um, things in red because there, there will be questions about that. Abruption is going to be painful dark red bleeding where a previa is painless, okay? 
Um, so back to talking about an abruption. Um, mom is going to have a lot of pain. Um, their abdomen is going to be very rigid. It will be hard, um, you know, hard like a, the outside of a watermelon. So very hard. Their abdomen will be um, when we put mom on the fetal monitor, you'll be able to see baby um, having um, large D cells at the same time mom is having um, contractions. And you will know then that, you know, you've got something bad happening. OK. Um, with a placenta previa, they're not having any pain other than maybe I have some contraction pain. Right. Um, that is normal, but their, their um, uterus is going to contract normally um, so that, you know, it'll, as the contractions come, it's going to get harder and it's going to release and soften up. So that's normal. It's just you're going to have um, bright red bleeding. You may have some clots coming out if that placenta is covering that, that um, cervix. So um, one of the rules in OB nursing, L&D nursing, is if your patient comes in bleeding, you don't stick anything in her vagina, okay? Because we don't know what we're putting our fingers or a speculum or anything into. Um, if you have a patient that comes in that's pregnant and is having a, a good amount of bright red bleeding, we are going to um, get her on the monitor and probably get a stat sono ordered and get with a physician and find out what exactly may be happening here. Um, why would that be a problem, do you think? Why would we not want to check someone that is having bright red bleeding, um, especially if they have a previa? So if my uterus, I mean my cervix, good gracious, my placenta is covering the opening of that um, cervix and I go to check the patient with my fingers, I can actually stick my fingers through that cervix into the placenta, which is going to cause just more problems. Okay, so as a rule, OB nurses, we do not check a patient that's having um, bright red bleeding. Okay. Um, All right, so what are we going to do as a nurse for an abruption, okay? Um, so we are going to get patient, the patient in the bed um, and we're going to call our healthcare provider right away. Um, hopefully you have someone that you can call to help that can start working on getting mom on the monitor, getting blood pressure um, on, get an IV started. Well, someone else is calling that physician to tell them that they need to um, come on down to your triage room and help you out. Okay. Um, we're going to monitor that blood pressure. Um, every 15 minutes is what it says, but if I truly have someone abrupting really bad, I'm going to set that even closer, um, maybe even every five minutes. Um, we're going to get mom and baby on the external fetal and uterine monitor because we need to see what's happening. Um, we can put babe, um, mom in a sideline position. Um, typically, this is not going to happen because we're doing so much else um, that we're just moving very quickly. Um, somebody's got to get a 18 um, gauge IV in, and typically I try to get two of those. Um, I want double IV access um, just because if we're in an emergency situation, anesthesia likes to have a second one. If we need to run blood in one, we can use the other for meds and fluids. Um, so I'm going to get at least two um, IVs started. It never hurts to put an extra IV in someone. While it might be uncomfortable for that patient, you have an extra access and it's just a, one of those cautionary things. It's easier and better to have two and have to never use one and take it out than have only one and it blow and then you be in a real mess. Um, we're going to go ahead and draw a CBC. Um, we'll do a PT, PTT, INR, RH factor. We'll get a type and cross match going. Uh, and then we're going to look for signs of developing DIC, which is disseminated intravascular coagulation. 
So we're going to talk about that in a little bit, um, which basically just means our, your patient is going to start bleeding from every orifice. All right. If you if it took you three tries to get an IV started, all those IV sites are going to start bleeding. Um, she may her gums and nose may start bleeding. You may have bleeding from the ears. You may have bleeding from all old sites that, um, you know, if they have an old cut on their arm or something, anything that's still slightly open at all is going to start bleeding. Um, it's quite crazy when you see it. Um, you may have reduced um, platelet levels, fibrinogen and prothrombin. Um, like I said, bleeding from injection sites and IV sites, you might start seeing some um, ecchymosis or bruising um, in places. So we're going to prepare for a stat C-section and we're going to monitor blood loss. That's going to be a huge um, issue um, for mom postpartum. What she delivers is the amount of blood loss that she's had. Okay, with a placenta previa, um, things that we are not going to do, again, a VAG exam, we're not going to put in any kind of internal monitoring as with that placenta covering the, the opening of the um, cervix, we can't put any internal monitoring in, okay, because that's just going to push straight through that placenta. Um, we're not going to do any Leopold maneuvers pressing on that belly. Um, we're going to want mom to be on bed rest, um, especially if baby is um, preterm and she's having some bleeding. So we may put her on bed rest there at the hospital. Um, they can do an LS ratio, which is looking at fetal lung maturity before delivery. Um, that is not something that I have seen done in my practice. Um, only because as a um, smaller hospital, that wasn't something we had the ability to do. Um, it could be done and then it would have to be sent out. Um, usually by then the patient's either delivered or stable. So it wasn't something that we did readily. You probably will see those more um, done at those tertiary care centers um, like Shands UF and possibly um, North Florida. Um, Patient's going to stay on bed rest. We're going to notify our physician. We'll get a sano um, blood pressure. We're going to get IV started. Um, remember, two lines is better than one line. Um, I always go ahead and do that for cautionary um, issues. We're going to go ahead and get a CBC, do clotting studies, um, make sure we know that RH factor, and get a type and cross match done. Um, we'll monitor for um, contractions and fetal heart rate. We can put mom in a sideline position. This one, um, you'll probably have more time as long as mom is not in active labor. Um, we're going to monitor blood loss um, because that's another issue that we may have with this patient. And then um, let mom and, and family know that she's probably going to have um, a C section if she um, continues to contract. Okay, so remember we said the difference between an abruption and placenta previa is pain, okay? They're both going to have bleeding. They both are at risk for having these other um, issues, but pain is really the difference between these two. Once you get baby on the, on the fetal monitor, you'll be able to see a difference because baby's going to have um, deep, deep decelerations with every single contraction um, and and or be running very just bradycardic. So maybe that heart rate is only running in the 60s. So you'll be able to tell the difference between the two. Um, remember, abruption, that mom, her, her abdomen is going to be hard like a watermelon, um, very hard and um, she's going to be in an immense amount of pain. So we're going to notify the healthcare provider, tell them what we think is happening, what do we see. Um, so remember, anytime we're calling a healthcare provider, we can't just call and say, um, you need to come on while, while you're, you know, 
coming on, I need to get you some more report. I need some vital signs. I need you to tell me what do I see? Um, what do I hear? What's happening? Okay, so you need to be prepared to give some vital signs, tell them what the baby looks like, um, all those kind of things. We can put um, some um, O2 on mom. We want to get some IV started. We're going to monitor for any um, crazy bleeding that might happen. And then we're going to prepare for an emergency C-section. Just because if we don't have that placenta and it's pulling away from that wall of the uterus, we are going to have a compromised baby. Um, and eventually if we're, we move on to, if it takes, takes too long, that we have a compromised mother as well. Okay, guys, so C-sections. While C-sections can be both scheduled um, or planned, um, they can also be emergent. And there's usually a couple different types of emergent. Um, in my practice, we had um, a scheduled C-sections and we had a... Um, a, C a stat C-section which has to be done within 30 minutes. So a stat C-section um, actually would be called um, from the time that the doc decides to call the emergency C-section until um, you are actually doing the incision in mom is has to be 30 minutes or less. Um, so that's a stat C-section, a true emergency. Then there are unplanned C-sections that need to be done, but they're not necessarily emergent. That means baby looks fine, mom looks fine, we can move at a little bit more reasonable pace. Um, so there's several different kinds that you can have. Now, anytime you have any kind of surgery, and um, this goes for regular general med surge patients or OB patients, anytime you undergo surgery and anesthesia, there's a risk for lots of problems okay so um, aspiration risk um, there's risk for infections there's risk for complications so a c-section is considered a higher risk procedure than a um, normal vaginal delivery um, of course we can have um, we can get the patient can get septic they can have a thromboembolism or a um, pulmonary embolism. There can be injuries to the um, urinary tract, the bladder, the um, colon, the intestines. All those things are in the same general area. If I'm in an emergent situation and I'm rushing to um, do the C-section, there's possibility that other organs can be injured. Something can get nicked. Um, so we always have to be aware of that. Um, our C-section rate in the United States is about 30%, but it is, gr it is growing. Um, some of it is due to um, elective C-sections. Some of it is due to um, the rate that we um, induce people. So labor is a natural process. Anytime you start adding interventions to that and by interventions I mean um, inductions if it's a medication that's an intervention if I'm breaking water that's an intervention if I'm um, placing monitors on baby's head or inside the uterus those are interventions so anytime you start adding a lot of interventions to the delivery process that's where we get a lot of problems from okay um, vaginal birth after C-section rate is decreasing. Um, so a vaginal birth after C-section is just that. They, um, mom would like a trial of labor, meaning that she would like to try to have baby vaginally and not have to have a C-section. Um, most of the time these go very well, but when they go very bad, they go very bad. Um, because we, that mom is now at risk for having that uterus rupture along that 
old incision site um, because remember when um, scar tissue scar tissue is very fibrous and it doesn't stretch so if I've had a c-section that means there's a line of scar tissue on my uterus so that line on your uterus is not going to give it's not going to cramp and contract um, like the rest of the uterus so if for some reason that that scar tissue is weak after um, a lot of pushing or intense contractions that um, scar tissue can give and actually bust open um, and then you have a uterine rupture and you only have minutes to get baby out before you're looking at a very impaired baby um, so mom has to be aware of all those things prior to and uh, most providers are going to make her sign some sort of a consent saying that they are that you understand that there are a lot of risks for um, a VBAC. Um, so one thing to note um, about babies is because baby doesn't come out vaginally so I don't go through that process of having the contractions getting squeezed having to go through all those motions to come out the vagina I'm going to keep the fluid in my lungs um, so these babies are going to be more at risk for having transit transit tachypnea or respiratory distress so those are some things that we have to remember um, about these babies when we talk about babies um, in our next lecture